Eric Eggers is here. He's a researcher and reporter with the Government Accountability Institute. He's the co-host of the Drill Down podcast with the great Peter Schweitzer. Eric Eggers, how you doing, brother? So to be clear, that my role to come on in the last hour was spent encouraging people. Am I now to do the opposite? Yes, that's exactly right. You are going to crush, crash us back down to earth and swat us with some reality of how uh, easy it is maybe to cheat. Well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if you uh, if, if we think it's easy to do this or not, and if if they would ever stoop to such a low, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you don't. Yeah. You, th- you think you don't? You think people would? Yeah, you know, absolutely they would. I mean, um, I actually wrote a book in 2018 called Fraud, How the Left Plans to Steal the Next Election. And um, that was, you know, obviously before COVID. But what my book detailed, again, six years ago, is the vulnerabilities that exist in America's election system, uh, things like bloated voter rolls, the problems with absentee ballots, um, people who are motivated to cheat, and just a complete lack of safeguards that exist. Uh, for people that do want to try to manipulate and undermine election integrity. And then, of course, COVID happened, and all of the ways that are the weakest in which we cast ballots were the ways in which we cast the most ballots. And rather than be honest and say, hey, maybe we have some legitimate problems, we were told that it was the most safe and secure election in American history. Uh, And then a lot of those problems have sort of now been baked into the system. And so, yes, unfortunately, um, while the Republican National Commission, you know, they've hired a lot of different people. Uh, we've got more lawyers. They say there aren't like never before, but there's lots of problems that continue to exist. And all you can hope is that um, by being honest about it ahead of time, then maybe there's more oversight. And so some of these problems can be caught beforehand as opposed to three days after hundreds of thousands of ballots magically appear on election night. It has to be caught before. I do not see any scenario where the day or three days or a week after the election, they we find something so obvious, like it could not be more obvious that there was cheating, and the courts or the state or whoever removes votes and then switches the winner of the race, like, and, and that's it. I, I, there's, I cannot see that happening. No, I think you're right. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that's where problems like the fact that you have um, lots of fraudulent names and and voter rolls. I think that's one of the biggest things. To me, that's where the focus should be. Uh, Because once, to your point, once a ballot is cast, there is nothing that connects a fraudulent ballot to a fraudulent voter because the ballot's disconnected, right? So you can say, hey, we believe that, um, you know, thousands of legal votes were cast, but that no one's doing that analysis in real time. Um, mm-hmm. All they're focused on is counting the ballots and then declaring the winner and then silencing any dissent because the yes. threshold after the election is so high uh, that it is almost impossible to do anything about it on the back end, which is why the work that the lawyers are doing on the front end is say, hey, we see hundreds of thousands of fraudulent registrations here. Um, Can we please do something about that? And you have to be willing to fight the claims of racism and voter suppression. I mean, Mike, remember this, right? So 2020 happens. Everyone's like, hey, we had a lot of problems. We don't think that um, the fact that, you know, tens of thousands of votes popped up overnight in these five swing states, and that happens to swing elections. That doesn't seem ideal. So it takes some preemptive steps about it. And Georgia, for example, said, okay, well, we're going to pass an election reform bill. We're going to put a couple of safeguards in place because we know we're one of the states that people raise concerns about. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, you know, American elections are supposed to be intentionally sterile. Like they're supposed to be politically sterile. It's just the voter in the ballot box. We don't want people near them trying to influence them. So we're going to say no political literature anywhere within 500 yards of the polling place. That's the way it's supposed to be, and that's where it's going to be now. Um, people lost their minds. They made the Major League Baseball All-Star Game move from Atlanta. They tried to get Coca-Cola <laughs> and Delta to leave Georgia because it was so racist to consider that we have to have intentionally politically sterile environments for elections. People couldn't have it. So, like, that's the atmosphere that this conversation is taking place in. And, it's, yeah. you know, just like summer of 2020, it's like, when, yeah, people are just looting because this is what we're doing. 2021, yeah, we're just going to move the Major League Baseball game because, of course, but, like, in hindsight, you're like, no, that's ridiculous. What if the thing <laughs> happened? And that's how we do elections. Yeah, I remember, was this the whole um, Joe Biden calling it Jim, Jim Eagle? 
Because <laughs> it's even worse than Jim Crow. It's ah, it's Jim Crow 2.0. It's Jim Eagle. But I'm bummed. <laughs> and I'm, I, I remember the hit. If, uh, so you had the, you you brought up the uh, no campaign literature. I remember the spin of in Georgia they won't let you drink water while standing in line. <laughs> like what? No, all it says is like a campaign can't drop pass out food and drink while you're standing in line within a certain distance like you can bring your own water you could heaven forbid hydrate before you get there the uh, polling station itself can hand out or leave water you just can't have the kamala campaign handing out bottles of water with their name on it and but it, it turned into that you're not allowed to drink water while you die standing in line for hours and hours it's well remember this mike only only democrats drink water Right, Republicans right. are lizard Good people, point. so we don't actually exist. <laughs> Very reptilian. Us, substances. Yeah. us and Nancy Pelosi are reptilian in that way. Um, and I'll give my last contribution, and then I want to ask you how they're voting or cheating now or ways that they could. Um, but I, I just want everyone to always remember that one week before the election, PBS NewsHour ran a 12-minute special on how easy it is to hack into Dominion voting machines in Georgia. And then right after the election, most secure election of all time. Okay, so tell us about some some potentially bogus ballots in our swing states and how that exists. Yeah, it's a great it's a great point. Um, you know, DeRoy Murdoch did an excellent analysis of this. Uh, or he's highlighting these analyses, but you know, states like Georgia, um, some statistical analysis have found that there's potentially over 500,000 phantom voters. Uh, they're tied to over 100,000 potentially invalid addresses. I mean, this is basic statistical analysis that anyone that has rudimentary software can perform, but the software has flagged. That's among the things they flagged in Georgia. Nevada's got its own problems. You've got uh, people registered to vote in casinos and at UPS addresses, and we've got you know parking lot-based voters in the four figures. So, and remember, right, when you have five figures of ballots total, in five key swing states that swung the election in 2020, um, you know, everything kind of counts. And I'll be honest with you, Mike, one of the biggest problems you run into is an incentive structure problem because the people that are in charge of these states, when people flag, like, these voter registration anomalies for them, they're not necessarily incentivized to want to validate them or address them on the front end because it, these are things that happened on their watch. Yes. So mm -hmm. these are part of the challenges they run into. Uh, North Carolina's got similar problems. You've got, you know, according to this analysis, over 400,000 phantom voters that are registered at um, over 100, you know, 159,000 invalid addresses. Now, this is after the fact that North Carolina has actually been proactive. This is one thing that makes me very um, I'm optimistic about North Carolina because they've removed, they announced recently over the last couple of years, 750,000 illegal voters uh, or potentially invalid voters from their voter rolls. Michigan, by the way, is doing the opposite. That's why I'm concerned about Michigan. Of course, their Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, was part of the George Soros-funded Secretary of State program, and they have resisted efforts to clean up their voter rolls. And they've announced that, well, there's 500,000 voters that we're concerned about, but we're probably not going to, we're definitely not going to move them before this election. And if they don't vote in this election, then maybe we'll do something about it. And this is despite uh, a legal effort on behalf of Republicans. So what you run into then is like when you have potentially illegal addresses or illegal registrations on the voter rolls, you've got the same people that fight to keep these vulnerabilities that exist, the, the Mark Elias funded legal effort. A lot of that money is also behind these groups that go out and register voters, in my opinion, regardless of the legality of the potential voter. And then so you're, you're kind of cramming potentially illegal votes through the same holes that those lawyers fight to keep open. Now, four years ago, we didn't have the migrant problem that we have now. We've now seen five figures worth of people that are – imported into these swing states. So I think there's a very real concern that people are going from the border to the ballot box. And actually at the Government Accountability Institute, where I work with, as you noted, the great Peter Schweitzer, we have a new report on election integrity that highlights exactly what some of these vulnerabilities are, um, you know, in terms of the, the voter roll bloat. This, by the way, Mike, is not something that only conservatives talk about. There was a 2012 Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court cited Pew Center statistics that said one in eight voter registrations in this country are wrong uh, or flawed in some way. So, uh, and this, you know, this is, there's lots of reasons for this, including administrative neglect. It's not necessarily all intentional, but it's absolutely something that can be exploited by bad actors. And when you consider 
what's perceived to be the unique and historic existential threat that is Donald Trump. There's not a motive in Trump on the left mm. to manipulate the outcome election in whatever way they see fit. Well said. Eric Eggers, he is at the Government Accountability Institute. So walk us through one of these illegal aliens who came into America mm, a couple of years ago. So he's, he's had plenty of, this person's had plenty of time to, to you know, get a driver's license or whatever. Um, how, how does that person potentially, how is a ballot potentially dropped off in that person's name since they've been here? How does that work? Um, I, yes. Well, have you heard of a ballot box? Oh, sure. or a ballot harvester. <laughs> so, I mean, it's as simple as that. All it takes is somebody being registered to vote, a lack of verification. I mean, this, the state of Nevada, for example, has already admitted that they have um, over 3,000 non-citizen votes that have been cast in the last four years. And they've done a, a reactive kind of scrubbing of the voter rolls. And they went back and found these people on the ballot and said, oh, okay. Well, I guess that we should take this person off, and it turns out they voted, and that's not necessarily that's not necessarily something they're going to highlight. Is oh, sorry, we messed up. The state of Arizona recently said that their default, if you don't prove, um, if you don't provide a proof of citizenship, their default is to only let them vote in federal elections, and they had over six figures worth of voters with that status. And the reason why they went back and did that analysis is actually somebody who wasn't a citizen that was registered to vote. So it's as simple as somebody that's not a citizen gets registered to vote. The default assumption is that you are a citizen. They don't make you provide a proof of citizenship when you get registered to vote. It's up to the immigrant to go back sometimes if they're illegally or erroneously registered to vote and say, oh, no, no, please take me off. Because if yeah. you're an immigrant that wants to become a citizen and you do cast a ballot, it's fatal. I mean, it's a capital offense. And so we've seen people, well-meaning uh, migrants, deported because they've committed, in their opinion, the, the accidental sin of casting the ballot. But they get caught up in these political machines. So it's as simple as your original question. You get registered to vote by one of these many get-out-the-vote efforts, and then someone will then take a ballot in the ballot harvesting era. They can request a ballot on your behalf. They then take you the ballot. Uh, they help you fill it out. And then in many states, you're now allowed to take that ballot and go deliver it on this person's behalf. So uh, it's much easier, unfortunately, than people want to believe. So, by the way, I'm looking up that story about the 3,000 in Nevada. And the first mm -hmm. story that popped up was the New York Times. Republicans seize on false theories about immigrant voting. So this is you seizing right now. So the so an immigrant comes. I just want to make sure we get this right. And the immigrant legally, let's say an illegal immigrant comes. What it, what's and they and they register to vote, or they get a driver's license, and in some states that automatically registers to vote, or you just sign up that you fill out the registration form. What safeguard is put in place in any of these steps along the way that that at least they're trying to prevent this person from voting illegally, whether it works or not, we can chat about. But are there any safeguard attempts? Yeah, those would be our good friends at the DMV. So. Um, when you get because of our motor voter laws, when you get your driver's license, as you noted, um, the default is to like the DMV person's not allowed to say you're not a citizen. The DMV person's not allowed to ask for proof of citizenship. So you can say I'm a citizen, and then you're registered to vote. Now, good election supervisors and or proactive attorneys, they do they have some databases that they can kind of verify this through. But this is one of the concerns with things like same-day voter registration or last-minute voter registration mm -hmm. efforts is that a lot of times the time doesn't exist to then do an analysis and do that comparison. So ideally, good election supervisors will perform this analysis, but it happens not as regularly as you think. And in the last stages of an election, which we're now in, um, that, that analysis happens far less than it should. So they register to vote. They say, yes, I'm a U.S. citizen. They get mailed a ballot? Sometimes, uh, by the way, sometimes they are registered to vote, right? I mean, it's not necessarily somebody proactively going to the voter registration effort. Consider this, Mike. Do you remember the first thing that happened, one of the first executive orders that the Biden administration signed in March of 2021? It was in the name of our country's unfortunate history of racial oppression. We're going to leverage the full might and power of the federal government to use every federal agency to register to vote. So uh, like we have health and human services are going to um, the people that 
access their services. You've got the Department of Education getting people that they're paying with Pell Grants to register people to vote on college campuses. HUD is registering people to vote, uh, or at least providing them literature to vote when people that live in these um, housing developments, public housing. Uh, people that are on food stamps, SNAP, the Department of Agriculture, is ordered by the Biden administration to go out and register people to vote as part of this executive order. And oh, by the way, when people of Congress say, hey, can you please come tell us what it is exactly you're doing under this executive order, they're being stonewalled. You've had the U.S. Marshals say, hey, look, we've been ordered by the Bureau of Prisons to stop going after bad guys, and we have to make ways for people that are in prison to cast ballots in Mississippi. And oh, by the way, we're concerned because we think this may actually lead to illegal votes being cast. So there's an all-out effort to get people registered to vote. So all that to say is uh, it would not be challenging for an immigrant when you look at the amount of money and effort we give people that are coming to this country. We're trying to get them relocated, uh, sometimes often at the expense of money that might go to, like, hurricane victims in North Carolina. But that's a different story. But then we're saying, hey, here's all these different federal services that you have access to. And, oh, by the way, these same federal agencies have been mandated by the Biden administration to provide people with lots of literature to vote. So, yeah, it's, it's a whole out effort to do this. Wow. So, yes, they encounter one of these people. They then get registered to vote. Their name goes on a voter roll, and it's up to somebody to perform this analysis. This is why you're seeing statistics like you are about six figures in these key swing states of potentially erroneous voter registrations. And then it's just about can these political machines get a ballot to these potentially illegal voters. That's why you hear this language in 2024. It's not about going after voters. It's about going after ballots. Yes. All right. Let's go over some numbers here just so everyone knows. Uh, let's just pick, uh, let's do Michigan. So voter, so, so that's all the illegal stuff. But then there's also just other shenanigans. So voters who moved out of state. I should say shenanigans that can be taken advantage of. That, that's mm -hmm. like that, that's very exactly, nice exactly the right language to use. Yep. Uh, voters who moved out of state in Michigan, 162,000. So what's the idea? Like, so I moved out of California. I don't remember like telling California that I moved. <laughs> I certainly didn't tell the DMV, right? So I'm probably still on the voting rolls there or something. So there's people who are still on the voting rolls in Michigan who at that address will receive a ballot or how does that work? Yeah, well, it depends on if the state is one of the states that mails everybody a ballot, uh, which some states do. Now, I don't think Michigan is one of them, but that's where the push to mail everybody a ballot in 2020 was flagged because they're like, wait a minute, there's lots of people who don't live here anymore, and we're just going to mm. mail these people ballots. By the way, Mike, it's funny because when I did the research for my book, uh, you know, I remember finding people who were registered to vote in more than one state, and I talked to one of them. I said, well, wait, you're registered to vote in maybe three different states because you might own property there or you used to live somewhere and then you moved. And I said, why didn't you tell them that to take your name off the voter roll because you've helped create, you know, part of the problem? And they go, well, it's none of their business. <laughs> so conservative mindset and like wanting the government to not be aware of what they're doing has kind of accidentally contributed to this. But to the point of like, is this something that people take advantage of? The answer is absolutely. Um, one of the statistical analysis and studies we did that my book was based on was we went out and gathered all the voter roll data that we could from the 2016 election. And we ran it through like credit card databases and everything else. And what we found is that um, over 2,000 people – I live in Florida. Over 2,000 people cast a ballot in the state of Florida and then cast a second ballot in a different state. Wow. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember the 2000 election in which a presidential election swung on 537 votes cast in the state of Florida. Back in Florida was a swing state. So the point is statistical analysis can show – that I mean, those are 2,000 illegal votes in, in one of those states, right? So illegal votes absolutely happen, uh, and they happen partly because of the bureaucratic administrative error and bloat that exists on the voter rolls. The voter roll errors are the gateway by which illegal voting occurs. Is no yes, doubt. And, I, and I would say those errors are on purpose, or at least not, not fixed on purpose. Purposefully not fixed, to say the least. Um, okay, we could chat forever about this, and I want everyone to go read your book, Fraud. Um, but let's wrap up with what can we do? What can we do now with 20 something days and 24 and how, when, if the election, if the results come back in Michigan, right? So the polls are, you know, Trump up by whatever and the polls and the result, you know, same thing happens in 2020 where all of a sudden a water paint, a pipe breaks and then they come back and, and I come the winds Michigan. We're like, what, what do you do? What could, what, what's your preemptive suggestion on what we do? Well, Mike, you've made it very clear that my job is not to inspire and encourage. <laughs> 
I'm sort of, you've made it very clear that I'm like the emotional heroine for your audience. So I want everybody to kind of just like, we're, it's like a big audio. I, I think that, look, I think just being able to be honest about the conversation is step one. Because remember what happened in 2020, you know, you could raise issues on the front end and then the election happens and all those votes came in and then big tech like shut everything down. And we were told that this was the safest and most accurate and most secure election in American history. By the way, by the same people that told us that Joe Biden was cognitively like at his peak. So, I mean, I think one thing is four years later, we now know, hey, they lied to us and the stuff that they tell us isn't always accurate. So I'm, I'm encouraged about that. I'm encouraged about the fact that because there is free speech on platforms like Twitter and X, that people are able to raise issues proactively. I do believe that Republican election officials, they've learned a lesson from, from four years ago. Number one, they're going to play by whatever the rules appear to be. But number two, the fact that we're even having a conversation in October and you're seeing people take administrative errors like these voter rules seriously – I think it's a big deal. So I do think that those are reasons to be uh, encouraged. And the fact that they've proactively, I mean, these lawyers have sued to try to get, I mean, they've identified the problems on these voter rolls and they've addressed it with these states. The fact that North Carolina has been proactive, even with a Democrat governor, by the way, mm -hmm. um, I think is encouraging. So I, I do think this is a problem people know about and they have tried their best to address on the front end. Well, we've only had four years, so um, I want to. We, we should run, but we can maybe talk about this another day. I don't want to catch you off guard either. But the other day, we did a segment on votefromabroad.org, mm -hmm. and this bill that was passed in 1986, and it they they make it seem as if it's for service members who are deployed overseas, and it is that. But there's like seven different groups of people, like like people in the military and their family members and people who work for the Department of Defense and the U.S. Merchant Marines. And then the last group is, oh, and every other U.S. citizen abroad. <laughs> like, well, hold on. And the Democrats announced that they uh, are spending six figures to uh, register people who don't live here anymore. So I went through the process on votefromabroad.org, the absentee ballots for U.S. citizens abroad. Vote from abroad, daughter. And you fill out all the information, and it, it says, you know, your most recent address in America. So I just made up some address in Pennsylvania, and it automatically fills out the form of Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which I just made up, and fills it all out for you. And then it says, do you want a ballot? And you can get it by email. And in 31 states, you can vote online. And I did the whole process until the very end where you had to sign your name and it said, you know, under perjury or whatever. And I know that they would arrest me if I continued to press send. But uh, how about that? And they, they, the, the Democrats say there's 9 million people living abroad, citizens living abroad. Uh, I saw some other analysis that was like two two and a half million. But still, two and a half million citizens living abroad. What are the rules for that? No, it's a great question. And I think, look, I mean, we are a third world country when it comes to election technology, right? Um, like, Baltic states, I think, like Estonia, are using, um, like, not Bitcoin, but technology like that okay, yeah, to be yeah. able to, yeah, you know, to be able to kind of like, so I have a piece of it, you have a piece of it, and they keep it secure that way. Our answer to that is, well, we don't have one big federal database that you can hack because it's so it's decentralized in terms of its 50 states as a laboratory of democracy. But when you look at the technology that we use, um, and you look at the fact that, like you just said. Like, think about the story you said about what PBS ran the special on mm -hmm. um, bef 10 days before the election. And there are stories where they have, like, hackathons where 10-year-old kids go out to Nevada and they hack these election databases. And it's like, oh, look what they did. Um, <laughs> so, it, yeah, there remain lots of different vulnerabilities uh, overseas and domestically. And so I think, look, you, you kind of – and. It, the, to me, the biggest crime of what the last four years is, is after January 6th, anyone that wants to just have an honest conversation about the vulnerabilities so that we might be able to protect them and shore them up so that we can have as much confidence as possible in our democratic outcomes. Anybody that raises those questions was now labeled a, a traitor and treasonous in, in the wake of January 6th. When I don't believe, I actually think it's maybe one of the most patriotic things you can do to say, hey, look, here's a problem we have. What are the solutions? Uh, and so I think what you just did is highlight something that's a very real vulnerability. Congratulations on not admitting to a felony on that. <laughs> I told the story once, and someone was like, did, did you commit a felony? I was like, no, no, I stopped right, right, right before. But, uh, but <laughs> yeah, listen. I'm if, not a if, lawyer, but maybe that's not a story I would need with <laughs> Listen, if, uh, if I believe this is an existential, existential threat to win, uh, then, you know, I would be inclined to vote. Or I should say if I was a Democrat who thought, because I know the story of Douglas Mackey, and I know that even years later they would come back and get me if I uh, dare. Uh, lie on that form. Uh, Eric, where do you want to send people? We can learn more about this. 
Uh, yeah, if you guys want to go to the drilldown.com, that's the website where we do our podcast with Peter Schweitzer, and that's the website where our election risks uh, report is now live and published. You can read about that. And, uh, yeah, if you just Google uh, Eric Eggers fraud, which is not a phrase I, like, love to say, but, um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's yeah, great. You can check out my book, uh, For All of the Left Plans to Seal the Next Election, which came yeah, out. Yeah, that's great. Year. Unfortunately, my, my publisher would love it. Yeah, you're the one who called it that. And you, now when people search your name, those are the three, Eric Eggers and Fraud are the three that pop together. What a bummer. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing I'm married because it would be a real problem if I was like, you know, had a dating profile. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Eggers, giant fraud. Uh, Eric exactly underscore right. Eggers on Twitter. Uh, thedrilldown.com is the website. Eric, good to talk to you, brother. Hey, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it, man.